What do all of these things have in common? Well, they're all made of elements. Everything in the room that you're in right now is made of elements. In fact, I should probably be a bit more specific. Everything in the entire known universe is made of elements. So what are they? An element is a substance that cannot be broken down into any other substance. Elements include substances that you might have heard of, like iron, which is a metal that we use to build things with, or oxygen, which is a gas that we breathe. What makes each element different is that they're made up of their own type of atom. An atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist. And that's not technically the whole truth, because later on in this video we're going to learn about subatomic particles, particles smaller than an atom, but I'll leave that for later in this video. Only 92 elements exist naturally, and what that means is those 92 elements existed already in the universe, before we even started to even think about what an atom was. Scientists have been working over the years to smash together smaller atoms to try and make bigger elements, and now we know 118 different elements. Because each element is made up of its own type of atom, that means that there are 118 different types of atom. We can find a list of every single element that we know about on something called the periodic table. It contains lots of handy pieces of information about each element and actually orders them together based on similar chemical properties. Most of the elements that exist are metals and we can find them on the left hand side of the periodic table. Metals tend to be quite shiny and are very good at conducting electricity and heat. Metals include things like gold, aluminium and iron and they are all solids at room temperature. The rest of the elements are non-metals and we find them on the right hand side of the periodic table. They don't have the same kinds of properties as metals, they tend to be quite dull and brittle and we find them in mostly the gas state at room temperature. Non-metal elements that have these kinds of properties include things like chlorine and oxygen. Some non-metals like sulphur and carbon are actually solids at room temperature but the rest of their properties are very similar to the other non-metals. As I said earlier, every element can be found on the periodic table. On the periodic table you will find lots of useful information, but one of the most important is the chemical symbol. Each element has its own symbol made up of one or two letter code. The first letter is always a capital letter, so that we can identify when a new element is starting in things like symbol equations. We'll learn about those in a later video. The one or the two letter code of a symbol is internationally recognized. That means that a scientist from any part of the globe will be able to know what element that you are talking about when you write its symbol. Not all of the element symbols make sense at first, but that's because some of them are based on other languages, like Latin, Greek, or even German. One atom on its own doesn't have the same properties of the rest of the element. A gold atom isn't, well, gold, it's not shiny, and it's not a solid, liquid, or a gas. It's just an atom. Bringing lots of atoms together is what creates properties. This bar of gold has a very large number of atoms inside of it, and bringing all of those atoms together, that's what makes gold a nice, shiny, gold-colored bar, and is what makes it a solid at room temperature. Most of the world around us isn't actually made up of elements by themselves. It's made up of either mixtures of elements or compounds. Compounds are made up of two or more different types of elements that have been chemically bonded together. That means that there's been some kind of chemical reaction. Compounds are useful as they tend to have different properties to the elements that make them up. A great example of this is sodium chloride, that you probably know as table salt. Table salt has a great taste and is very important in our diet. We need it to be able to live. However, the two different elements that make it up, sodium and chlorine, have very different properties. Sodium is a silver metal and is very reactive with water, whereas chlorine is a green gas and is very toxic. Too much of it will kill you. So how is it that sodium chloride is fine to eat? Well, it's to do with how the atoms are arranged. In sodium, 
all you have are sodium atoms, and in chlorine all there are are chlorine atoms, but in sodium chloride there are both sodium and chlorine atoms, and they are mixed together in a different arrangement. This different arrangement of atoms is what gives rise to the different properties. So why is it sodium chloride and not sodium chlorine? Well, there are two rules that you need to know about when it comes to naming compounds. When a metal and a non-metal come together, the name of the compound combines both of the two elements together. The first part of the name will contain the metal, and that remains unchanged. However, the second part of the name is the non-metal, but we slightly alter the name of that non-metal to include the ending "-ide". So when sodium and chlorine react together, we make something called sodium chloride. When iron and oxygen react together, we make iron oxide. And when we react magnesium and sulfur together, we get magnesium sulfide. But Mr. Gundry, I've heard about something called magnesium sulfate. How is that different to magnesium sulfide? Well, anything that ends in eight means that there is a non-metal and oxygen involved. So when magnesium sulfate is formed, it's formed of magnesium metal, sulfur which is a non-metal, and oxygen. Let's be honest, we all want to be a little bit lazy sometimes. Well, have I got some news for you, because chemistry is the perfect subject to be a little bit lazy in. In fact, the periodic table is set up in such a way that we can be lazy, and I'm talking about chemical symbols. When we write down the names of chemical elements, or chemical compounds, we often find ourselves going, oh, why do I have to write down such long-winded names? I don't want to have to remember the difference between magnesium and manganese, although that is important. Well, an easy way to be able to write down elements is to write down their chemical symbols, and the same can be applied to chemical compounds. When we combine chemical symbols of different elements to make a compound, we write down the chemical's formula. Let's look at the examples we've already been looking at sodium chloride, iron oxide, magnesium sulfide, and magnesium sulfate. We know that sodium and chlorine react together to make sodium chloride. Sodium symbol is Na, chlorine symbol is Cl, so sodium chloride is, you guessed it, NaCl. What that formula tells us is that for every one atom of sodium, there is one atom of chlorine. Iron oxide's up next, FeO. For every one atom of iron, we have one atom of oxygen. Next we'll look at magnesium sulfide, MgS. What that means is for every one magnesium atom, we have one sulfur atom. Finally, let's look at magnesium sulfate, MgSO4. This means that for every one magnesium atom, we need one sulfur atom and four oxygen atoms. Inside atoms, there are smaller particles, called subatomic particles. These include protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms have been represented in lots of different forms over the years. You've probably seen quite a few of these in popular culture, in TV shows and movies. But there is a preferred way to draw atoms, and that's as a circle, with protons and neutrons in the centre, which we call the nucleus, and electrons around the outside in levels, called shells. Here I have built a hydrogen atom. It has the symbol H and is the first element on the periodic table. It is made from one proton and one electron. If I move to the right one, I reach helium with the symbol HE. It now has two protons, two electrons and two neutrons. I can go one further, back to the left hand side of the table and onto the next row down, to lithium. Lithium has three protons, three electrons and four neutrons. What did you notice as we move from one element to the next? Well, moving along one element to the right meant that the proton and the electron number went up by one, didn't it? Well, that's because each element has a unique number of protons, and moving from left to right on the periodic table across all of the elements, you'll see that their proton number always increases by one each time. We call this number the atomic number. The electron number also increases by one each time, and that's because there is always the same number of electrons as protons. The neutron number changed quite randomly, and there isn't really much of a pattern to how many neutrons there are in an atom. So, how do you know? Do you just guess? Well, there is another useful number on the periodic table. It's called the mass number, 
This tells you how many particles there are in the nucleus. Now, we already know how many protons there are in a nucleus because we're given the atomic number. So all we have to do to work out the number of neutrons is subtract the number of protons from the overall mass number. Some elements have isotopes. These are atoms of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. An example is chlorine. Chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Chlorine 35 is more abundant. What that means is if I surveyed all of the different chlorine atoms, I would find that actually 75% of all of the chlorine atoms that exist are chlorine 35 and 25% are chlorine 37. That isn't very useful for me in that form. What I need to do is work out something called the relative atomic mass. That takes into account both isotopes and gives me an average of their masses taking into account how abundant they are. On the periodic table, we can see that chlorine has an atomic mass of 35.5. That doesn't mean that it's got 0.5 of a proton or 0.5 of a neutron, that's its relative atomic mass. We've calculated it using a mathematical formula, and we're going to do that together now. If I take each isotope's mass and multiply it by its percentage abundancy, divide each one by 100, and add it all together, I get the answer of 35.5. That's the number we see on the periodic table. We take subatomic particles for granted sometimes, but we haven't always known that they existed. In the early 1800s, John Dalton proposed the idea that atoms were solid spheres that couldn't be broken down into anything smaller. But that wasn't a new idea, and actually if we go back to 5th century BC and we look at a Greek philosopher called Democritus, he already proposed the same idea, using the word atomos, that means uncuttable. About 100 years after Dalton proposed his model of the atom, J.J. Thompson came along and called his the plum pudding model. He said that atoms were balls of positive charge with negative charges moving around randomly inside. Those negative charges he called electrons. A few years later, Ernest Rutherford put the plum pudding model to the test. He fired alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil that was only one atom thick. He was able to come up with two conclusions from this experiment. First of all, the positive charge must be very small, and he said that that was in the centre of the atom and called it the nucleus. The second thing he said was that the electrons, the negative charges, must be orbiting around the outside of the atom, so far away from the nucleus, making most of the atom empty space. Later experiments found that the electrons orbit in specific shells around the outside of an atom, and that the nucleus can be split up into two different particles, the proton and the neutron. The most current model of the atom says that electrons orbit at specific energy levels, called shells. These energy levels can hold different numbers of electrons. The first two elements of the periodic table, hydrogen and helium, both have all of their electrons in the first shell. Helium has a full shell of electrons, so atoms that have more than two electrons need to have more shells. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine and neon all have two electrons in their first shell, but have the rest of their electrons in the second shell. After neon, the next row of elements, also known as a period of elements, have a third shell of electrons. Each shell of electrons has to be filled before the next shell can be started, and there can only be two electrons in the first shell, but eight can fit into the second and third shell. You only need to be able to draw and write the electronic configuration of the first 20 elements. Today we've learned that elements contain only one type of atom, and that atoms are the smallest part of an element. Compounds are substances that contain two or more different elements that have been chemically combined, and each element can be found on the periodic table, and that the periodic table gives us lots of useful information about each element, like its symbol, and its proton, neutron, and electron numbers. We've also learned that elements can have isotopes, which have the same numbers of protons and electrons, but different numbers of neutrons. Thanks for watching, and tune in next time when we'll be covering more about chemical reactions and using the periodic table. <laughs>